blessing this afternoon. Please be with us now, too. This is our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask us all stand together as we sing our theme song, To Heal a Hurting World. Thank you to the team for leading us in that song. Isn't that a wonderful song? It's not in the hymnal, by the way. It's a uh, song that was written by some folks actually at uh, Weimar University, one of the, the uh, families there. All right, I have just a couple of announcements. First of all, have any of you enjoyed the meal? All right, so if you have enjoyed the meal, Make sure that you say thank you to Chef Anthony and the kitchen crew that's helping out there. It takes a bit of work to put that all together, and we're so grateful that he's here with us. Amen. Now, another announcement I have. Some of you heard Pastor McIntosh, and if you haven't heard him before, you might have been a little surprised, but it was a treat, wasn't it? He's uh, always entertaining and always inspirational, and so we praise God for that. He has some materials. Uh, he's written a book, The Law and Its Logic, Where Atheists and Christians Agree. That sounds like a provocative title right there, Where Atheists and Christians Agree. So he's going to have these available, uh, I believe, for sale in the connecting corridor there, and then also he has some DVD sets on seven-part health and training DVD series for New Start Global. So if you're interested in either one of those during one of the breaks uh, before Sabbath, you can check that out. He'll have some out there in the connecting corridor. And I think that's the announcements that I have for right now. Our testimony uh, ministry highlight Dr. Cha, come on up. She's going to uh, share with us. She has a ministry that kind of grew out of a personal experience. Yes, and so that's true. You have 15 minutes. Okay. And she's also one of our presenters in the breakout session mm -hmm. to follow at uh, 315. So just so you know. And I have to say that the breakout sessions, we have been really blessed to have great presenters here, and I feel your pain, and you have to choose one to go to. The good news is we're trying to get them all recorded. I think we're recording them all, and they should be put up on, they're going up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, probably sometime within the next week or two, something like that. So you do have to choose, but you won't 
ultimately miss out. They will be available. All right, the time is yours, and I'll make sure to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, let us start my testimony time. I just want to pray one more time, okay? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as uh, I share, I just ask that your spirit would guide and bless these words and this time. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I have 15 minutes to share. Okay. So we have this. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joyce Che. I'm an ophthalmologist from the state of Washington. And I moved there about uh, 12 years ago to uh, get some country property and do some country living because I was in California and I couldn't afford anything. And God has blessed. It's been a blessing to be there. But it's so good to be back here in Michigan where I went to college and academy. And so it's always nice to return here. Um, when I was in my mid-20s, I was put on an antibiotic. And it was, is it this one? Ah, okay, let's see. I was put on an antibiotic that was taken off the market because it caused liver failure and death within two years of me putting, being put on it. And it's a category of medications that they give quite frequently. Uh, it's, called, it's one of the fluoroquinolone antibiotics, same family as ciprofloxacin and that type of thing. And it left me with a lot of weakness and pain and this kind of thing. And I, I thought that I was just aging poorly. And in 2011, I was diagnosed with leaky gut. I'd been already diagnosed with some other things. And um, I was told that I had to go on a paleo diet for, for me to recover my health. And because paleo and Christianity, I thought, did not mix well, and didn't make sense to me. I thought I had to research this and research why are so many Seventh-day Adventist people who are interested in God's health message and eating God's ways, why are we still getting so sick and what can we do? And so that's how we started with our, our cookbook. That's how we started an online course called the Autoimmune Recovery Plan. And we also, in 2021, we started this online course called Med Missionary. And this is where we have an online medical missionary training program. And we teach people how to recover their health through diet and uh, lifestyle changes. And that's at medmissionary.com. Now, I, the way that I got into natural remedies and God's way of doing things was that in 2007, I went to Wildwood and I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Burnell Baldwin and Lee Wellard. You know, Lee Wellard is here this week. I haven't seen him yet. But Dr. Burnell Baldwin shared with us about what the uh, lifestyle sanitariums had done during the time of the Spanish flu. And I was so impressed with these statistics, and I was so impressed with the things that I heard from the spirit of prophecy, that it was as if I was hearing these things for the very first time. And it made me think, I need to go home and share with my church, we could have another pandemic. And that was in 2007. And so I thought, how am I going to let people know that these remedies work? And how am I going to do this in a way that doesn't jeopardize my reputation and my license and this type of thing? And I thought, I will share with people who have failed antibiotic therapy. And God allowed me to uh, interact with a lot of people who had like staphylococcus, um, uh, what, MS, MRSA, um, Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, cellulitis infections, and uh, uh, antibiotic resistant pneumonias, and this type of thing. And God gave me so many stories that it made me so confident that I could move forward and trust in His Word. But <clears throat> when I became health ministry director at my church, I found that I really lacked. I would, I would help people with their lifestyle. We would get people off of a lot of things, like they'd stop smoking and, and these types of things. But for these real mysterious conditions, I didn't know what to do. And I had my own mysterious problem because of the, the antibiotics that I had been put on. 
So today, I want to share with you a story that illustrates why we do what we do. What we do is we teach people about what's happening in agriculture. We teach people about what's happening in medicine. We teach people about what's happening in the microbiome, why so many people are having leaky gut and food sensitivities and this type of thing, and what more we can do with a whole foods plant-based diet with soaking and sprouting and these types of things that can have huge effects for health. And I'm going to share the story of a boy. His name is Lucas. Now, Lucas had a normal delivery. He was born in 2015. Uh, I did not get to know Lucas until he was two and a half years old. And so I'm sharing you this story from what his mother told me. At the age of two months, he developed severe eczema. At the age of four months, he developed severe diarrhea. At the age of six months, he developed severe vomiting. He was hospitalized at the age of nine months and diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis. And this is a condition that, is, that used to be fairly uncommon. And now, not only adults are getting it, children are getting it. It's associated with a lot of allergies, food sensitivities, and this type of thing. Um, what happened with Lucas is that he developed such severe symptoms, especially of ex eczema, that he was put on a lot of uh, medications steroids especially, steroid creams, oral steroids, and as far as how he was developing, because he was having so much eczema, do you know when you have eczema, you have a lot of malabsorption? And also, when you have a lot of diarrhea and vomiting, consider what happens to a young child. This child was not able to grow or develop. He couldn't hardly walk. He was having 20, 30, 40 episodes of diarrhea, vomiting a day. So you can see this is what his eczema could look like. And when he was on steroids, it would help initially, but then they knew that they had to get him off. And after a while, the steroids themselves caused him to react. And so you can see how difficult it would be for this family and for this child. Now the problem with food sensitivities is that this is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. It's not an immediate thing. And so you can eat something and not develop a reaction until a few days later, which is why when we introduce people back to certain foods, we'll say try a new food every three or four days, right? Because it gives you time to develop that delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So this is what Lucas looked like at the age of 30 months, two and a half years old. So he was about, I think, uh, 18 pounds, something like that, and he could not walk. And what ended up happening is that his mother, now you might think that his mother was too health conscious, but she was actually very conventional. Her father is a science professor uh, at a graduate level, and she was very, very conventional. And that's why at two months, four months, and six months, he had his eczema, diarrhea, and vomiting. This was a vaccine-induced injury to this child. And this child, though, unfortunately, when the mother would say, my child is responding, the response was that that's not a possibility. And so what ended up happening is that they had to not go to the doctor for a while because otherwise they were being told that, that what they were seeing in their child was not actually what they thought. And so this family was trying to figure out what to do on their own. And they were given infant formula after infant formula. This mother would go outside and eat organic peaches off their tree and then breastfeed, and their child would have massive reactions. It was a very difficult situation. And as the mother was praying, God impressed upon her heart that he would heal her child, but that she had to learn how to heal, how God wanted to heal him. And so she was praying about what to do, and the Lord put 
his mother in touch with my friend Mercy, who we've written the cookbook together, who has a lifestyle center. And Mercy figured out what this child was eating. When you have such sensitivities to food, you will develop an aversion to many different things. Because you'll be like, you know, the last time I ate something like that, it made me throw up. And this child had major aversion. He only liked eating corn chips. I know a lot of you are like, corn chips? Who would feed their child corn chips? But some of you are eating a lot of corn chips, <laughs> right? And so it, they're yummy. And this child liked him, and that's what he could eat. He liked corn chips and maybe a few other things. Well, Mercy found out what he liked to eat. She started making other things with sprouted quinoa. They would make quinoa chips. They would make different foods that he would like using healthy ingredients. And they did things like onion and garlic broth, which is very anti-inflammatory to the, to the gut and it will help with the microbiome and this type of thing. They also did enemas using garlic broth, enema. They did things like breast milk enemas and this type of thing just to help build up that microbiome. Aloe vera as well. And praise the Lord with these remedies, and you can see what the infant formula was. It was one and a half cups of coconut water, one cup of coconut milk, half a cup of sprouted cooked mung bean, one fourth cup of cooked quinoa, one fourth cup of cooked buckwheat, and all the time observing for food sensitivities. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. When I first heard about this, how do you think I felt? What? A little crazy, you feel a little scared, don't you think? Yes, yeah, you feel a little scared as you're doing this. Uh, but when you're a parent and you're trying to figure out what to do for my child, you're just desperate. And we were, uh, we were feeling that desperation, especially Mercy was feeling that desperation. Now, the diarrhea stopped. The mother said that when they applied the garlic broth enemas, the diarrhea slowed down to two movements a day. The vomiting stopped. The skin slowly began to heal, and he started to gain weight. Praise the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Amen. Now, what happened is this. This child was two and a half years old, and he'd been coming to church week after week. What would you do if you saw a child who looked very unhappy and a family who looked very scared like this coming to church week after week? What would you think? And you were asking them, are you visiting the doctor? Well, no, we can't. What are you doing for your child? Well, this child was reported to Child Protective Services. And what happens when you go to Child Protective Services is that you cannot tell the doctor, I've tried this infant formula, it doesn't work. My child will have a reaction to this. You can't do that because I, as your doctor, have to, t have to think for the child's best interest, think maybe you as a parent aren't doing your job. And so you have to go through the whole thing. You have to go through all these infant formulas. They put an NG tube down. When they do this in the hospital, they don't understand that you're supposed to feed only certain times of day. They do 24 hours. And of course the child could not tolerate this. And so they went down the list, infant formula after infant formula. The child began developing more of these reactions. The skin problems came back. You can see how well he looked before. And then when he went into the hospital, this started happening. And finally, they said, he needs to be on, he needs to be on IV formula. So they put him on total parenteral nutrition. This child almost died. Now, I am telling you this not because I want to uh, share with you this is you know, doctors are not good. I am a physician myself. Uh, but this is the thing. We doctors only know what we know. And if we haven't seen anything different, we wouldn't know. If I hadn't gone through all of these things with my friend Mercy, I wouldn't know. And so this mother, she called us and she asked, could you speak to the doctors here? Could you talk to them? And guess what? I was... I was scared, Mercy was scared, and we said, sister, can we just pray with you? And we did not have the courage to talk to her doctors. This mother, the reason I wanna share this with you is this. 
we are going to go into very difficult times very soon. I think many of us are going to be faced with similar types of challenges where when we want to do things God's ways, that we might be, we might be accused of being too healthy, too rigid, too religious. And there is a risk that many of us are going to be thrown into situations like this. When I share this story around the country, there are many mothers who come to us and say, I am going through this situation. And I want to share with you that the spirit of prophecy says this, a physician who has the moral courage to imperil his reputation in enlightening the understanding by plain facts in showing the nature of disease and how to prevent it, and the dangerous practice of resorting to drugs, will have an uphill business, but he will live and let live. It takes courage for for us to just share the simple facts according to the spirit of prophecy. For a mother to come in and say, my child reacted to this. For me as a physician to say, I believe you, this child reacted to this, takes courage, amen? As we go into the future, I pray that we would have courage. Now, the other thing I wanna share this story for is that this mother, when her child was hospitalized, she had options. She could have panicked. She could have uh, been very angry. But she chose at that moment to surrender her child to Jesus. She surrendered her child to Jesus. And today, I'm so thankful to tell you, this lady has no bitterness against any church members. This, this lady has love for Jesus and forgiveness and just thankfulness that her child is alive. Amen? And so we can go into these situations and we don't have to be upset or angry or anything. We speak the truth in love. And because we want to win our brother and sister, and then we can go through our trials with peace. Amen? That child almost died. But the Lord allowed them to meet a, a doctor who believed them and said, you know, believe this mother. Do everything that she tells you to do. They took out the, the TPN. They, they gave that mother whatever she asked them for, and they let them go home. Amen? Six months later, this is what this child looked like. He went home and he started doing the enemas again. He went home and he started doing the infant formulas again. They started, instead of giving the, the um, formula that he was starting to react to, they started giving more and more and more of the infant formula that they were making. And praise the Lord, God allowed him to recover his health. And today, he is a healthy eight-year-old. This is him two years ago. And so praise the Lord for this beautiful testimony. I hope that this is an encouragement for you, an encouragement to be faithful to Jesus and to trust in him no matter what. Thank you for that inspiring testimony. It's a little challenging for us physicians, sometimes we look around at our colleagues in the world and we're a little bit intimidated. Oh, if I do this weird thing, people are going to think, like, and what if I lose my license? But uh, praise God, if, if we choose to follow his ways, he will be with us. And, and honestly, a medical license in this world, in the light of eternity, means nothing, nothing at all. All right, I have the privilege to introduce my friend. Dr. Tim, he was one year behind me in medical school, but we did hang out together, uh, Tim and, and uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, we were kind of in a little group of crazy people who would uh, meet up between classes and read things like Ministry of Healing and talk about how we were going to change the world and all the things we are going to do. And uh, praise God, we are still on the path, still working on it, and God uh, is good. Um, Tim graduated, and he went on to Stanford to do a residency there, and uh, then 
after finishing Stanford, he hasn't sat still since, I don't think. Uh, he, I, I have a hard time keeping track of him. Even um, a, f a few years back, we became friends on Facebook again, or I should say for the first time, because like, we were already friends in real life, but I just couldn't keep track of him. And so now Facebook tells me when he's traveling, because he'll text and say, oh, I'm going to be in uh, Amsterdam next week. Anybody want to meet up or whatever? And I think, if I understand correctly, pretty much every month since finishing your residency, you have volunteered somewhere for something, sometimes medical, sometimes doing weeks of prayer for schools or churches or conferences all, all around the world. And so today we have the privilege of uh, Dr. Tim coming up, and he's going to be talking to us about how to share the three angels' messages with anyone. Yes. With anyone. Anyone. All right. Amen. Tell us. On. Can you hear me? That's great. How'd you like that testimony from Dr. Che? It's always inspiring, isn't it? How, how many of you here were for the testimony for Laurel's testimony? Yeah, right? Pretty amazing. So before I begin, I just want to start with that as kind of the beginning, that you can share with someone from a personal experience. It's very compelling. The average person doesn't want to know about the randomized controlled trial. I'll tell you that. We may need to know that as physicians, but they want to see before and after. They want to see what has this done for you. How has this affected you? I remember asking someone I was looking at an investment for my IRA, and of course, I'm going to do the research, I'm going to take a look at their track record, whatever, but at the very end, what do you think I asked the guy trying to sell me on this? What do you think I asked him? Yes, how much do you have invested personally? And he said a million dollars, and I'm like, wow, okay. And he wasn't like a super rich guy, he was just a regular guy had three or four kids, kind of middle management sort of thing. And I'm like, he believes in it. So what do you think would be most compelling? All the facts and figures, or at the very end, he says, yeah, I put myself on the line here. Their personal testimony, right? So before we begin, I'd like to start um, with God to give us each a personal testimony. Just bow your heads as we pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you that we can be here with friends, new and old, but ultimately our true friend is you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you would move me out of the way, use me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self, mold me, fashion me, raise me, that I might speak clearly your words on how we can share with others, how we can have life and have it more abundantly. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So, how many of you have heard of someone named Ponce de Leon? Who knows who Ponce de Leon was? Ponce de Leon was a guy looking for the fountain of youth. And although he never found a literal fountain of youth, people are still looking for that even to this day. They just look in different ways. But people are trying to find something that will bring them back to where they were. They desire that experience. They desire something that's going to put them where they were before. And they're willing to do things like surgery, like medications, like lifestyle change, like coaching programs. They're trying to get back to where they were. And not everybody has the same sort of needs. Perhaps you wouldn't use Botox or something like that. Uh, perhaps you wouldn't do plastic surgery. Perhaps you might do something like dye your hair, right? I remember talking to someone, and I asked her, I said, I, I, I noticed that uh, you dye your hair. What, why, why is that? She says, because God made me blonde. I was born that way. But, you know, it fades over time, or the grays start to appear. 
So it's not necessarily something that is just something superficial. We sense that things are going a direction that they shouldn't go. When that gray appears, people kind of panic a little bit. And just like uh, Dr. Che shared about eczema and this whole uh, scenario with this little child, in modern medicine, a lot of us are going to look at this and treat the symptom, right? Anyone know who Dr. John Chung is? Anyone know Dr. John Chung, a few people? He's my dermatology go-to guy. And I said, Dr. Chung, so I'm, I need the review because I understand if it's dry, you wet it. If it's wet, you dry it. And everything else, you use steroids. He's like, actually, it's different now. If it's dry, you use steroids. If it's wet, you use steroids. And everything else, you use steroids. So that, that's what people are doing now. They're just throwing a medication at something to cover the symptoms. And that's the same thing that people are doing now. They are trying to live their lives and be healthy and have energy, but it's just covering a symptom, right? Think about in medical school. What do all medical students take to keep up, to stay up for their rotations, except for Dr. Hess? He didn't use any caffeine, right? Neither did I, probably not Dr. Kelly, but most of them use what? Caffeine, right? For sure. But again, if you're tired, what should you do? Sleep. Isn't that funny? I had classmates always talking to me, hey, give me that hydro treatment. Can you do that hot and cold thing to me again? Like, hey, was that echinacea you took that last time? What was the thing? And I'm like, well, you could, but uh, how many hours of sleep have you gotten the last two weeks? Oh, maybe like three, four hours. And I'm like, well, maybe you need to sleep. No, man, I, I got finals. Are you kidding me? There's no way I can do that. So we do things that create the illusion of well-being, right? And that's what the dying of the hair does. It creates the illusion that you're younger than you are. But what about a different approach? What if you could give somebody something unique, something different? What if you could heal them from the inside out? Is that possible? This is my hand, okay? I have a mole on my palm. Don't worry for the dermatologists out there. It's been the same for 20 years. It's not melanoma. So, But I use this as my hand because I don't know if you can appreciate this, but near the mole, you will see the root of this hair, right? And what color was that hair? It was gray. And it turned back again. I'll challenge you. Ask your phone right now. You can ask it. It's okay. I'll allow you to talk while I'm presenting. Can you turn gray hair back again? And see what your phone tells you. Anyone want to tell me what their phone tell told them? What did it say? What, what did Healthline say, according to Siri? She said it's impossible, unless you're willing to dye your hair. So this is the thing. What I'm showing you here should be impossible, right? Should be impossible. And that is what we want to share with people around us. We want to share with them that the impossible is possible, giving them hope. How many of you were impressed with Laurel losing 42 pounds in three months. She doesn't have to be an MD or a JD or some D, right? She's already an authority in weight loss. Do you realize that? Because she herself did it. That's the concept. A personal testimony is the most powerful thing. And I'm all about people living longer, living stronger. That's our whole ministry in onlylongevity.org. But if I can't be my own commercial, how compelling is that? How many of you remember the old ad where the guy was like, <clears throat> let me share with you about Hair Club for Men. And he kind of went on this big spiel, but at the very end, he pulls up this picture. And I want you to know that I'm not just the president, but what? 
I'm also a client. And the picture showed him, like, how did he look before? He completely had no hair, right? So afterwards, he had hair. Our personal testimony is the easiest way to share. And you can be your own commercial. When people look at you, they'll see something different. And not everybody has the same thing, right? With Laurel, she was losing weight. If any of you knew me, how many of you knew me in medical school? What did it look like I needed to do in medical school? I needed to eat, right? Sally was always trying to feed me these great meals every Sabbath, and I still just didn't look any bigger. It was just very odd. I weighed 140 pounds. Do you realize that? I'm six foot one. 140 pounds is pretty light. Dr. Hess weighed that when he was maybe in seventh grade or something like that, right? <laughs> Because he's a, you know, a strong construction kind of rugged mountain man. But that's what I'm sharing is that you can use your own personal testimonies to make a huge difference in people's lives. And as long as that's connected somehow to their need, they're, they're all ears. Well, I lost 42 pounds in three months. What do you think they're going to ask you? How did you do that, right? They're wide open. Now, obviously, you're not going to ask me in medical school and say, hey, I lost 42 pounds in three months. And I'm like, I'd be dead by then, right? So <laughs> you have to use it judiciously, and we don't all have the same testimony. But for me, what was very intriguing is to watch using a protocol, turning my hairs back again. And, you know, they were very faint, not necessarily all gray, but then they would get darker over time. Even my nose hairs, right? This little nose hair that I got that turned back. I mean, I know it may not be a big thing to other people, but to see things growing back darker, thicker, that's something that's interesting to me and intriguing. I always try to keep, keep the root right here near the mole so you can kind of see where things are going. But ultimately, I actually did one uh, just recently, like last night, I found a couple that were turning. I don't know if you can see this one. This kind of like grays out right here because people say, oh, but you were doing good and then that's bad right here, and then it turned, you know, black again. But did you know this is just as good as this? Because right here, I know how fast my hair grows, so I can figure out what I did here, and I can figure out what not to do. Does that make sense? As well as what to do as far as the thing that occurred here. Now, this is just for comparison. This is a purely gray hair, white hair that I harvested. And this one is just showing, like, how it's thin. And do you notice how much thicker it gets near the root? So I'm noticing not only a change in color, but a change in thickness. Now, people will say, ah, nobody does that. Nobody pays any attention to their hairs. I'm sorry. Did you know Jesus Christ counts every one of your hairs? He does. Did you know that? It says that in the Bible. So I think that we can get a clue here. Now, to give full disclosure, what Siri told you is not only false, according to my own personal testimony, but Cleveland Clinic, other institutions have done studies now on the possibility of reversing those signs of aging. Now, what they claim is they have a smaller sort of trial. It wasn't very large, honestly, but they found that people who had stressful events, if you remove them from those stressful events, they could recover from the signs of aging. However, they said it was impossible after age 40. Now, just for full disclosure, I'm turning 50 next year. So that is not true. That is not true because I had a hair just recently. Let's see if I can find the one from today. Uh, okay. Whoops. Let me go backwards. Can I go backwards? No, there's no going back. Oh, there we go. I can go backwards. So anyway, yeah, this one has a little dot, a little black dot there. I don't know if you can appreciate that. But sometimes it's like just happening, like literally something I did like a couple days ago. But sometimes it's a little bit longer. Other people have, you know, maybe some skin issues. Like they want to cover over the blemishes or whatnot, maybe acne, maybe the wrinkles. How many of you know who said, if the barn needs painting, paint it? Who said that? 
Sherwin Williams. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Anyone know who said that? Yeah, that was HMS Richards. That's pretty amazing. He actually met Ellen White. Incredible. But I tell people is that makeup is not necessarily superficial because the wrinkles and the damage of your life wasn't meant for you to be. How many of you know the story of Naaman? Now, he wasn't a girl trying to do makeup or he wanted better skin. He had what? He had leprosy. Did you know when he was healed, you know what the servant of the Lord said his skin was? It wasn't rough and mountain man and leathery. She said he was restored to the skin of a healthy child. Did you know that? That's God's design. That's God's, what God wants for all of us. He wants to restore us. And that's actually what Ashley wanted. She had problems with her skin. Now, I think she is gorgeous no matter what she wears. But this is her going to work, and she's, of course, very professional. There's her name badge, and she's perfectly done up, and all her, her makeup is perfect and things like that. However, we looked last, this was just yesterday, and there's like a little Herald patch here. You had, what did it feel like, babe? It's a little itchy sort of patch, and so what do you think it was? No, not just dry skin. A little itchy sort of patch, kind of a little scaly. Not psoriasis, but before psoriasis, what is it? Eczema, right? So she had a little bit of eczema there, and we talked about it because this is what we do in our coaching business. We kind of evaluate, and we identified what it was and implemented the remedy, and what happened the next day, babe? Is it itchy? Did we put a steroid on it? Did you take some prednisone? No. no. What? I thought you said honey. I'm like, I don't remember us putting any honey. Oh, maybe she's just calling my name, right? <laughs> so anyway, she was like very excited when she started our program because she had tremendous skin benefits. And now this is her, and one of my friends, when he saw this picture... Anyone know who Wyatt Allen is? Anyone know Wyatt Allen? He's a pastor, probably a fellow colleague. Love him. He's very committed. He has a tremendous testimony also. And he said, yes, can you post some pics without the bright makeup? Can you post some pics without the red lipstick? And I said, Wyatt, that's no makeup, brother. This is no makeup. Just a recent pic. She has a testimony. And again, not everyone's going to look for you know, healthy skin, but each one of you has a commercial. You know what I'm saying? Each one of you has an area of the health message that you can understand, right? You might be able to understand migraines, right? You may be able to understand weight loss. You may be understand, you know, skin. You may be able to understand something about our health message that you yourself can share. You may not be able to give someone the exact food or whatever, like Dr. Che and Mercy can, but you can share what you know because everybody is on a journey, right? And when they think about the journey and where that journey is going to end, people are always open to some aspect of health. I'm telling you that. When we look at our brains, when we die, most of us only use up about 3 to 5% of our brains. Did you know that? And the people who are super geniuses, the Einsteins, the Schweitzers, only fill about 7 to 10%. In fact, they guess that our brains were designed not for 70 or 80 years, but for more like a thousand years. Did you know that? Perhaps it's not even a thousand years. Maybe it's forever. Now, these individuals don't live forever that I'm going to be talking about, but there are six longevity zones in the world right now. This is the original sort of National Geographic article that identified three of them. But is there anyone who can identify all six blue zones for a Trader Joe's gift card? Anyone ready to do it? Raise your hand if you can identify all six longevity zones. As of, I think, April of this year, the last one was identified. Can you do it? Go for it. Say it loud. Sardinia. Yes. Okinawa. Yes. Italia. Yes. Korea. Yes. Yes. It's yours. No, no. You need one more. <laughs> There's only five. I need one more. Someone, I'll let someone help you. 
Yeah, he said Icaria. That's Greece. Yeah. Sardinia, he said. I'll give you a hint. It's another zone in the United States, not Loma Linda. Anyone else want to try? I don't give participation trophies. That's not how I work, right? <laughs> you have to get the right answer. <laughs> there, yes? Costa Rica is, is Nicoya. He already said that. Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, incidentally. Anyone else? All right, I'll come up with another question, okay? I promise. I'll, I'll give it out by the end. So in Okinawa, Japan, when we look at what they're doing we can glean aspects of what they're doing and give these to other people. The average man lives to 78, average woman 86. That doesn't seem like a lot, but three extra years is very significant in the scientific world. And they have a lot less heart disease, a lot less cancer. What's the number one killer in the world? For all countries now, pretty much. Heart disease. I mean, there's a few exceptions like Norway, it's cancer and stuff like that. But in first and third world countries... You're looking at heart. And if you can reduce someone's risk for heart disease, you can tremendously help them. Most of us think about the plant-based diet, but a lot of us forget this little thing, ikigai. Does anyone know what that means? What does ikigai mean in Japanese? Purpose, that's right. For Fumiyasu, at 84, it is the Senior Olympics. His favorite event, the decathlon. His favorite event of the decathlon, the pole vault. Anyone 84 or older here? Wow, right here. When was the last time you pole vaulted? I'm just asking. You can say, you know, it was like five years ago or whatever. That's fine. But that's his purpose in life. He has something that he shoots for, and all of us need that. They also grow their own food. I remember Lucian. Is Lucian here? Lucian, are you here in the audience? Raise your hand. Yes. Lucian said, here in America... There's plenty of food to eat, but there's no quality. It's just stored for years, whereas in his home country, Togo, it's grown straight from the garden. That's beautiful. I also appreciated his testimony. I want you to know that Lucian and I had a great conversation at lunch, and he says, even though he's African, has been to the African church, he loves it here. Do you know why? There's two reasons why he loves it here. Where's Pastor Ron Kelly? I hope he's here because this is about him too. One, when they give the message, it's the truth. Number two, everyone is so loving here. And that is how to share things. If you can share the truth with someone and be loving, you can share the message. Do you realize that? If you can be kind and loving, that's an instant witness. And it doesn't have to be something like complex. It's just helping someone, maybe just smiling at them. But you all have an area of expertise because you yourself have gone through it, right? And once you've gone through it, you can give someone a compelling sort of testimony that most of us can't who haven't gone through that. The Okinawans also enjoy many other aspects of longevity. Sario Toguchi is 104 years old, and he's enjoying many natural remedies here. Can anyone name some natural remedies he's enjoying or has enjoyed? Yes, that's right, the garden. So food, anything else? Sunlight, absolutely. I just heard, is Dr. Youngberg here? Dr. Youngberg was telling me how important sunlight is. Did you know if your vitamin D level is over 50, you will basically never die of COVID? Like your risk of death is under 1%. That's amazing. It's incredible. So vitamin D, anything else? Sunshine? What else? Yes, fresh air, exercise. He just worked in the garden. He's taking a nap, so he's getting rest. But you know what's funny? Is the interviewer didn't look at any of those things, Right? He didn't look at what's called the elephant in the room. The interview didn't ask about rest or the garden or whatever. They said, Mr. Taguchi, Mr. Taguchi, why the red gloves? He said, they're easy to find. <laughs> this true statement. That's what the interviewer said. So when you look at this, we often will think about, oh, can you give me the herb for this? 
can you give me the procedure? I need the hydrotherapy treatment. Not to say that those things aren't bad, but sometimes it's the elephant in the room, right? If somebody says, every time I go to the family reunion, I get diarrhea. They're focused on what they're eating at the family reunion. But you know what, what the real issue may be? The family at the reunion. I'm just saying, right? And Ellen White brings that out. We're so focused in on the traditional sort of remedies, we forget the statements where she says, there may be some home trouble that is eating away at your health like a cancer, right? But we want to focus in on the minors, like the red gloves, so we don't deal with the big issues. And those big issues are often the uncomfortable things. Ellen White says nine-tenths of all illness comes from this. Does anyone know what this is? Disease of the mind. Have you thought about that? Do you know anyone that actually believes that? I know very few of us, even as physicians, but besides someone like Horst Mueller, right? I have to remind him it's not 99%. It's 90%. There's trauma. There's other things, right? Stuff like that. This is very important that not a lot of us think about, but the Moai is a group of people who go through life together and help each other. How many of you have people that you regularly get together with two or three times a week, not your family? Anyone have that? Not many, a few people. It's very, very healthy, very important that you stay connected. I was talking to one of my relatives and I said, hey, can you pick a couple friends? Let's do Matthew 18, because we were having some difficulty, so I wanted to approach this. And they said, I don't have any friends. And I'm like, you don't have any friends. That's a sad thing, right? To not have friends is a problem. Most of us think, well, the reason why people's health is bad is what? Their diet, right? And I'm not saying that it's not a fruitful cause of illness. For sure, it is. But I think sometimes we miss out, especially in the conservative circles of Adventism, of the other things that are kind of right in front of us. Let's look at Sardinia. This is Tonino. He is a shepherd that works 12 hours a day, splitting wood, slaughtering sheep, repairing fences, and he only needs the help of a little cane. In the Sardinian way, the family is important, is paramount. And a lot of people will say, but my family is not really that great. But ultimately, God still calls you to love them, to try to form relationships with them, as long as it's not dangerous, like they're not going to kill you or something like that or abuse you, right? When my family found out that I went from UC Davis, where I had a full scholarship, full National Merit Scholarship, to Weimar, what do you think they thought? I was bonkers, Right? Part of my family cut me off. But that person in my family, they would, I would talk to them on the phone, they'd yell at me and then hang up or just hang up. Literally, John and Sally Kelly and others were my family when that was happening in my life. And I will always remember that. Thank you so much. But I kept writing to this person. Every time I had a little something, I'd send a little postcard, send a little note, never heard back from them ever until one day, this relative had shut themselves away for Christmas. They lived in a gated community, very ritzy, sort of upscale neighborhood, told the guard no visitors. And I told my brother and sister, we got to visit them. So I went and visited them, and uh, the guard said, no visitors. Here's our IDs. Look at our last name. He's like, I'm not looking. I'm not looking. So we just all went in. And I went there, and the family member said, I told them no visitors. And I said, it's Christmas. Okay, come in, but just for a second. And that relative went into their back room and brought out a big box, and they put it down on the floor. And I said, what's that? They said, it's everything you've ever sent to me. And I've read every letter and postcard. Thank you for not giving up on me. And that person in my family was my mother, who was baptized last year as a Seventh-day Adventist. Don't think for a moment that your efforts are in vain. You may seem like you don't know very much. It's small. It's like a little postcard. It's a little whatever. 
But the servant of the Lord says no act of love is ever wasted. Did you know that? It is never wasted. And you don't know what the result of that may be until the judgment. When you look at the Sardinians, family is very, very important. Their entire family gets together once a week to eat a meal. Do you think it's important to eat meals together? Did you know the data shows that if you eat at least one meal together a day, that that is the most predictive factor for success for that child? Isn't that weird? Isn't that wild? Like, how could that be? But is it true? The servant of the Lord says, around the fireside and the family board. What's the family board? The meals. Decisions and characters are formed for eternity. Do you think it's important to eat together? Yes, it is. Absolutely it is. Now, in Sardinia, an interesting phenomena is that the men uh, live just as long as the women. And typically, women live much, much longer. Typically, there's four women that reach 100 for every one male. They're very outdoorsy. Uh, but perhaps does geography help? Because they, they're an island. So what's interesting is that Giuseppe, hopefully he won't eat this because he's going to lose some of his longevity if he does that. But his mindset is different. Most of us think like when we're tired, we take a day, what? Off, right? But what's interesting, the interviewer asked him, there's like, well, don't you feel tired? Don't you feel like you, you shouldn't go to work? And he was like, yes, I feel tired every day. You know, it's interesting, Dr. Youngberg and I were talking, and he's like, Tim, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm getting older. I, I, sometimes I don't feel like getting out there and exercising. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, but you know what I do? I get out there anyway. And I do it. And you know what? After I do it, you know how I feel? I feel great. He's 63. Wes is another person who doesn't dye his hair. He's like phenomenal. He's like the poster child. It's incredible. But that's the thing is Giuseppe has that same philosophy. When the, the interviewer said, when you're tired, why don't you just take a day off? He said, if I stayed home all day, then what? Then I'd be sick. Most of us do not burn out. We rust out. Now, people like Dr. Hess and Dr. Kelly, we probably will burn out, right? So we need to be careful on the other side. But most people need this sort of kick kick in the posterior, right, that Giuseppe suggests. Sardinia, they suggest that the grapes may be important. Um, who knows what quercetin and resveratrol are? Those are powerful antioxidants found just under the skin of the grape. Did you know that? So it's not in the wine. It's actually in the grape itself. And their grapes have 300% more of those antioxidants than the mainline Italian grapes. Also, they're an isolated island direct descendants. That's what they blame it on. And I want to talk about this for a second because a lot of people will say, well, I can't do that because everyone in my family has what? Whatever, like diabetes, right? I'll never do that because everyone in my family is overweight. But the real issue, it's not that diabetes runs in your family. It's that nobody runs in your family. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, right? That's the issue. Because when people say, well, that's genetic, what are they really telling you? There's nothing that I can do about it. Do you know what the most damaging line of thought is? For your telomeres, which is like the cell clock for all of your cells, it's learned helplessness. Did you know that? So if you feel like you can't do anything, no matter what you do, it won't make any difference. What is that? Learned Helplessness. And I'm here to tell you, genetics don't determine if you will get sick. They determine where you will get sick. So that person who told me, I'm vegan, I walk five miles a day, my cholesterol is 300. You know what that person's going to have to do? Even more. They're going to have to whip out the red rice yeast and the garlic and the beet juice and the oatmeal, Right? and the flaxseed, and the walnuts, right? They're going to have to, like, pull out all stops, right? Because the thing is, your body doesn't tell the difference. It's like cholesterol 300, deposit in arteries, right? 
doesn't matter. It does, it's not going to give you like a merit badge for being vegan. It's just going to give you a blocked artery. So once you know where your genetics are, then you know where to, to guard against, right? To really put the shields up. I text, every time I go to Walmart or Rite Aid or any of those pharmacies, what do I always send you a picture of, babe? Do you know why I do that? Because, yes, my grandfather had a triple bypass when he was 55. Is that early? It is. So where's my weak point? Right? Heart. So I send her the pressure. You know why? Even if it's high or low, do I send you the high ones too? It's like not many, like very rare. But once I send you a high one, why do you think I send it to her? Because she, like all good women, is going to nag me until it goes down, right? So she's going to be on me, and I'm like, okay, beet juice, right? <laughs> Kiwis, right? Exercise, right? I'm like, okay, here it is. Better? Yes, all right. That's the thing is you want that person to hold you accountable. We need each other. Do you know what the number one reason why people quit exercising is? The what? Nope. I tricked you. Injury is actually the number one reason why people quit exercising. But what's the number one reason why they keep exercising? A friend. Because if Susie Q is waiting for you at 5 a.m. on the corner to go for a walk, do you think you're going to hit snooze? Do you think you're going to text Susie for the third time and cancel? No, right? You're going to get up and go do it. You want that accountability. We need each other, right? Share your testimony. Share the good and the bad. It's okay. We need to understand that God uses people generally to share his message. The three angels aren't literal angels most of the time, right? Who are they? You. When I was in residency, I remember that I had two of my favorite attendings at Stanford and I went over to their house for a meal, and it was me and the husband and the wife. They were both ER doctors. They're two kids, but I saw six place settings. Did you know that? Anyone know why they had six place settings for the five of us? Anyone know what religion they were? They were Jewish. How did you know that? Who was the place setting for, the sixth one? For who? Elijah. Do you know they're still waiting for the first Elijah? That's us, guys. We're the third Elijah. We've got to be able to be there to sit at that setting. And that's not going to happen unless you're close to people, unless you're interacting with them. And don't worry that you don't have the degrees. You have a testimony. You know something because you've gone through it in your own life, right? A lot of the uh, critique on Sardinia is there's only 2,400 of them, and also they've noticed that obesity now affects 10% of Sardinians. What is it in the United States? Anyone know what percent is obese now of us? And, well, not 47. That's really high, but it's close to 40, right? It's, it's pretty close now. Yes, exactly, even higher. But what about me? Can I enjoy this advantage of living longer and stronger, well, you can. I actually made my own journey, and I went to where? What country are we in? Costa Rica. And I was very blessed to enjoy their longevity culture, and I met a woman who was 107, and I got to interview her and gleaned all the amazing things of her life and what her routine looked like, what her diet looked like, what her attitude was like. And the thing that really impressed me the most was I had brought her some food. I said, hey, would you like me to feed you? She says, no, I can feed myself. Thank you. <laughs> That's Maria. Of course, her name's Maria, right, in a country like Costa Rica. So I've tried to go to all of these zones of longevity to learn what people are doing, and now I'm implementing in them in my life. And I'm finding not only am I getting stronger and, you know, the aches and pains are going away, but my hair is turning back again. The wrinkles are fading away. 
And when we look at our favorite blue zone, right, we meet people like Marge Chaton. Did you know Marge was a nurse? Anyone know that? Who was she married to? A doctor. He lived to 98, though. He did pretty good. And uh, Frank Shearer was over 100. He was the longest-lived water skier uh, in the world at the time. Does anyone water ski? Anyone? Ah, pretty good. As someone who's vertical or horizontal there is raising their hand. That's great. This was one of my professors. I was in surgery with this guy as a student. It was pretty crazy. And the thing that was most impressive was this. Would you allow a 91-year-old to do open-heart surgery on you? What would you be afraid of? Yeah, the shakes, right? And I can tell you, Dr. Wareham's hands were completely steady. But that wasn't the most important thing that I noticed about him. And this is going to be very important, I believe, to not only sharing longevity with others, but your own journey. Is whenever like an artery would burst or the patient would code or something like that, or it's like complete like catastrophe would happen in surgery, he would just go like this. Um, okay, ligate here, suction there, clamp there, okay, shock, do this, right? He would just be very, very calm. And I asked the person, I said, why is Wareham so chill? And they said, he's been doing open heart surgery for longer than any of us have been alive. He's seen all the complications. And he's already aware of what to do. It doesn't stress him. It doesn't get to him. With that vast experience and knowledge, he literally is like riding a bicycle in every one of these situations because he's done it so often. Lydia Newton, at the time of the article, was 112 years old, one of the 20 oldest people on the face of the planet. And people say, well, the article says, is it good genes? Is it divine intervention? And the author says, God may or may not have something to do with it, but their religion, what? Does. That's the beauty of you being a Seventh-day Adventist, is that you live on average. Did you know that in COVID we lost a little bit, but the general population lost more? And there was a Baptist preacher who was talking about us. Maybe some of you saw this video. He says the average Adventist outlives the rest of us by 11 years. And at the time, the average lifespan in North America was 77 years. You do the math, he said. These guys keep the Sabbath. Once every seven years. Now, the math on that, 77 divided by 7 is 11, right? And when you give God those 11 years, do you know what he does? He just gives it right back to you. So the average Adventist lived 88. And this was a Baptist preacher. This is impressive, right? You can invite people to church just on that basis alone. Hey, If you don't like it, enjoy the longevity, right? Even if it all turns out to be false, right? You lived 11 more years of quality and quantity. But of course, it is true, right? The Adventists are the last blue zone I'll talk about. There's about 20 million of us in the world. And many of the oldest are not in the country, not that I'm against country living, but they're not isolated. They come from all races, and their common bond is their religion and lifestyle. What's interesting is if you're African-American in this country, you're at higher risk for two diseases. Anyone know specifically? Diabetes, right? High blood pressure. That's correct. But did you know that when they become Adventists, that those risks go down? Amazing. You don't have to be related to Ellen White to get the advantage, right? Right? You can actually join the club at any time and enjoy it. I'm going to share, uh, don't let me forget, I'm going to share one of my mentors, not Pastor Hess, but this is another mentor at Weimar. He was also a pastor, and I told him, I made an appeal uh, with that. I'm like, hey, we live a lot longer, and remind me to, to tell you guys what he said. This is actually Newsweek, a secular article. I have to confess, the big giant red arrow was not a part of Newsweek. I put it there because it says what? You're a Seventh-day Adventist. This is how to live forever. What's very interesting is, what does this say? You started formal schooling after age six. Do you realize this is how to live longer? This isn't about education. Do you think there's a connection between the mind and the body? Who's the one who recommended that kids start school later? Have you ever heard the book, Better Late Than Early? 
Does, I know you've never heard of that. <laughs> I know you have. This is another secular article. 11 habits that will help you to reach 100. Let me tell you this right now. Those who retire expire. That's it. I work with uh, two groups of very elderly individuals. One group is my patients. They're very sick. The other group of elderly individuals are my volunteers pushing them on the gurney. So what's the difference? What have the volunteers continued to do? Staying active and serving others, right? You need to do something unselfish every day. That's a part of our program. Did you know that? Whenever I go into the club or the lounge or whatever, I see someone struggling, and I'm like, this person's my guest. And they're like, but you don't know me. I said, I do now. I'm Tim. you got to do something completely unselfish every day. You got to keep serving others. You got to keep your icky guy. How many people knew that floss actually increases your longevity? Anyone know that? Yeah, a few people. Now, people say, well, flossing isn't part of the health message that Ellen White shared, right? Have you heard people say that? And I said, but it's the same principle, okay? How much does some floss cost? How long does it take you? To learn, this is for you, Kara, right right here. Got the floss in my pocket. How long does it take you to learn how to floss? A minute? Maybe a minute and a half? How long can you, like, I know you can whip through this in 15 seconds, Kara, but the average person can probably do this in about a minute, right? But did you know this actually lengthens your life? And they wondered how. Because here, let me give you an illustration. When you haven't flossed for a while and you floss, what happens? You bleed, right? And that's not because the floss caused the problem, but those gums were inflamed before you did that. And when the gums are inflamed, right, that means bacteria can get into the bloodstream. You say, oh, there's no bacteria in my mouth. Here, you know what? Floss, get that chunk of food out, and then go like this. What does it smell like? It smells like poop. It's nasty, right? Let me tell you, there's a lot of bacteria in their mouth. It's like one of the dirtiest places. And if you have inflamed gums, that bacteria goes where? Into the bloodstream. And the theory is that it inflames your coronary arteries, encourages plaque to deposit. If you floss regularly, you can get an extra couple years just for free. Did you know that? Amazing. How many people like to invest their money? Who likes to invest their money? Okay. How many people, if I told you, you could earn two to 300% on your investment? What would you all think I was telling you? A lie, right? Because it's too good to be true. But did you know that for every hour that you exercise, when they look at meta-analyses, you're going to live that hour again and two or three hours on top of that? Isn't that crazy? And when they look at what's the optimal level of exercise... I looked at Michael Greger. Anyone know nutritionfacts.org? He did this huge review on it. He says they don't know how much is ideal because not enough people exercise that much to get good studies. He found that at 600 minutes a week, how much is 600 minutes a week? That's a lot, right? That's like 100 minutes six times a day at five Mets. Do you know what five Mets is? It's like a slow jog. It's, it's pretty intense. He said even there, they were still getting more longevity benefits. Incredible. Move around. And people will say, well, but what's the best form of exercise to get? Whatever you're going to do every day. That's what I tell people. Whatever you're going to do. Because people say, oh, well, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. But do something, right? The problem is people are busy trying to figure out what to do and what's ideal that they don't do anything. When you go to the grocery store, don't spend five or ten minutes finding that parking place. Just park. And just walk, right, to the entrance. When you push the elevator button, don't go down one floor. Please don't let me watch you do that. Take the stairs, right? So there's lots of ways that we can get exercise just naturally. Instead of cutting corners and doing the, like, the easiest or the lazy way, do something that's going to get you to move. What's the most important meal today? Breakfast. Breakfast. Did you know? That if you eat breakfast with a whole grain, that you will regulate your blood sugar for that meal the rest of the day and you will live longer? Did you know if you eat breakfast 
compared to those who don't eat breakfast, that you will burn an extra 500 calories just because your body is going to be warmer and be more metabolically active? Did you know that? People say, well, I skip breakfast because I'm trying to lose weight. I said, no, you're trying to gain weight. I'm just telling you, it's true. Don't skip breakfast. It's very, very important. Let's look at sleep. How many people always sleep more than six hours a night? Oh, wow, good for you. You're one of like two healthy people out in the audience. I'm going to give you a little clue, and you can use this on anybody. This is how you figure out if you're sleep deprived or not. Are you ready? How many of you can wake up when you need to wake up without an alarm clock? Ah, oh, most of you. Now keep your hands up if you always remember your dreams. Now keep your hands up if you don't sleep in 90 minutes on your day off, like 90 minutes more than regular. There's only three people who get enough sleep in this audience. That's wild. Because those are the three simple parameters that your body uses because what your body does, now I don't know if you're of stage three, stage four sleep, the deep sleep, it's actually just all called S sleep. So your body will do the deep sleep first before it goes into a lot of the REM. And when you wake up in REM, that's when you remember your dreams. But if you're not having REM, right, you're not going to remember your dream. Your body's being shortchanged, right? So that's the thing is that you have to get sleep. My fiance and I, tell him about the triple sleep. What's the triple sleep? <laughs> People say, I would sleep till noon if I did that. I said, then you're not getting enough sleep, right? That's the thing is when you sleep, that's when you repair. Do you realize that? You're actually repairing your DNA. Your cells are repairing at that time, and that's how you regenerate. When your body is feeling tired, there's a reason why you're feeling tired. Don't just grab the energy drink. Don't just do the contrast shower, although I'm for contrast showers. You may need to do the sleep. The cold plunge may not be enough, right? I hope this is pretty plain. Eat whole foods. The more we mess with foods, the more we mess them up. Is that what I tell? That's what I kind of tell people. And this is going to sound like almost blasphemy, but I think some of these like artificially made sort of foods have a lot of sodium and fat, even the veggie foods. I think eating a whole uh, plant food diet is a lot better for you than people think. And they say, well, but I need to supplement, right? How can you supplement and make sure the balance stays roughly the same? Anyone know? Do you know what's a great supplement is seeds and nuts. They're like vitamins just by themselves. And I, I recommend this for people with high cholesterol. Do you know what nut can lower your cholesterol if you eat like four of them a month? Not almonds. Who said Brazil nuts? That's correct. There was a selenium study, and they looked at Brazil nuts, and they found that if you ate four Brazil nuts, they measured your lipids at day one, day seven, and day 30, and they showed that just eating four Brazil nuts would lower your cholesterol and raise your HDL almost like a drug effect. And they're like, why do you use a Brazil study because it only had 40 participants? I said, because it's a Brazil nut. What is the risk of a Brazil nut? Chip of filling? I mean, I don't know what the, what the risk is. But when you want to give people ideas, give them things that won't hurt them, right? First of all, do no harm, right? Number seven, it's not always what you're eating, but it's what's eating you, right? I'm going to have a participant. Uh, someone volunteer for me? Someone come up? Any of the kids? Come on up. Come on up. What's your name? What's your name? I'm going to give this to you here. Come on up. I won't bite you. I promise. Take this. What's your name? Levi. Levi? All right. Levi was the faithful tribe, right? So you're going to be faithful when all the other tribes apostatize. I want you to hold that arm's length. Hold it arm's length. Like, like this. Hold it like this. Yeah, no, the, the controller. Is it heavy? No. Okay, just stay there. It's light for him now, but it depends on how long he holds on to it, right? 
Go ahead. You can sit down, Levi. It's not that you have stresses in your life, but it's how long you hold on to it, right? One of the things that oftentimes we don't realize is we have these little conflicts, and instead of resolving them, we just sweep them under the carpet. Do you know your body doesn't forget? When your mind has forgotten, your body will remind you. Did you know that? It will tell you there's still something eating away that you need to deal with. That person you may need to reconcile with. Maybe just write them a letter, right? You may not be able to get their number. They may be dead, right? You may need to just deal with this with God and maybe a friend. Number eight, I'm not going to say live like a Seventh-day Adventist because that's what the article said. I'm going to just say you can be a Seventh-day Adventist. There's room enough for everybody, right? Be a creature of habit. How many of you know that when you're like ready to eat and you're hungry and if you kind of get busy, what happens two hours later? How do you feel? You're not hungry anymore, right? That's the thing is sometimes you need to stay on a regular schedule, a regular habit in order to enjoy longevity. Do you know that they found that in the United States during the fall and the spring that the incidence of fatal heart attacks goes up? Did you know that? Except in the state of Arizona, why is it? The time change. Did you know that? Did you know that just the time change of one hour is not just hurting you, it's fatal. And people will say, like Dr. Hess, like, I travel all the time, I go to all these different time zones, but we know the Lord sustains you. And I said, yes, he does, but I'm tired too. And I realize it takes my mortality down. No, that's not true. I said, it's okay. I'm willing to surrender some of my longevity to increase all of yours, right? Number, th- ele- number 10, how many people have a sister? Keep your hand up if you're close to your sister. Oh, pretty good. Did you know if you have a close relationship with your sister, you have less depression and you live longer? Now, why the study didn't work out for brothers, I don't know. Maybe we're just not empathetic. Maybe we don't listen as much. I I don't know. But if you do have a sister, try to be close to the people around you. Try to listen. Try to interact with them. They'll take care of you, and you'll live longer. Number 11, who can tell me what the marshmallow study was? Anyone know what the marshmallow study is? Someone tell me. It was done at Stanford at my alma mater. Anyone? The marshmallow study? Yes, it was on children. That's correct. Yes, they can eat the marshmallow, or if they waited, then what? They got two. Did you know when they looked at the timing for that child's ability to resist the immediate gratification, what do you think that was related to? Everything. Everything good. Marital success, financial success, no jail time, educational success, SAT scores, MCAT scores, anything anything you want to say that's good is related to that. The ability to forego the immediate for the eternal. Because for a one-year-old child, 15 minutes is eternity. I'm just telling you, that's how long the the researcher waited. But some of the kids actually waited and got the two marshmallows. Some of the kids waited, and then they ate it, and some of the kids just went, I think the average Gen Zer would just eat it at this point. Because their attention span is like TikTok related, right? It's like three seconds. I think goldfishes have a, uh, yeah, exactly. Goldfish have a uh, three three second attention span. But they also followed these kids for forty years, and they tried to find the personality trait that was related to longevity, and that was being what. It's up on the slide. Conscientious, right? What does conscientious mean? You say what you mean, you mean what you say, you follow through. When you're working out, you don't go one, two, skip a few, eight, nine, right? You don't cut corners. You actually do what you're supposed to do. And that's the funny thing is that most of our job as physicians is trying to get you to do what you already know you should do. Do you realize that? It's not really information people need. It's inspiration. It's motivation. It's transformation. That's what we're trying to do to people. And if they can see the same thing in you, they think, hey, maybe I could do that, right? Hey, if Laurel lost 42 pounds, she looks kind of like me. Maybe I could do it, right? Why not? I want to share with you uh, our acronym that we use. It's called Eternal Life. 
This is a spoiler alert, so feel free to take pictures and whatever you want. The acronym of eternal life is what is related to my gleaning of all the blue zones and my gleaning of what I'm implementing in my own life right now to reverse my gray hairs, wrinkles, increase lean mass, right? I'm 200 pounds right now. I feel good at that weight, 6'1", 200 pounds. I've got a lot more lean mass. I have a lot more energy, stamina, do about 5K a day. All kinds of stuff is going the right direction. But the first E is election, meaning you choose the good and you refuse the bad. But your election is make your calling and what? Election what? Sure. Amen. What is your purpose? John and Sally's purpose is being a home for those who have no home. They are a place of healing, not just physically, but for all who need it. And they have been that way since I knew them. And what do you know? John hasn't aged today. Does he not look the same as he did in medical school? Raise your hand, those of you who knew him. He looks the same, doesn't he? He doesn't age today. It's working for him, right? He's got his calling and election. Don't quit your day job, John. Keep your icky guy, right? Trust in divine power. Did you know that Ellen White, when she lists natural remedies, in one list, she doesn't say air, rest, nutrition, really. She says a clear conscience. Did you know that? We forget that. We're focusing just on the eight, but we don't realize she lists these in several other places. And there's additional remedies that I think are even more important. Do you think it would be important to be vegan? Or do you think it'd be more important to have a clear conscience? Clear conscience, right? Doesn't matter if you're vegan if you go to H-E double hockey sticks, right? You could be a mean vegan too, <laughs> right? That's not going to help you either. Exercise, and that's important to do, like whatever you're going to do every day. Did you know that I have a program that's only six minutes a day, and it's proven to prevent Alzheimer's? Did you know there's regimens of exercise just that short that can make a huge difference? And do we do that every day? Yes, we do, even if we're traveling. And I can show you how to do it. We did it in, where did we do our, the, our routine? In the mother's room. You can do it anywhere, right? You don't have to have a gym. We were outside. Some of you saw me outside on the grass doing part of it. Rest is not just the hours, but when you sleep. How many people here sleep before 9 p.m.? A few people. How many people sleep after 9 p.m., after 10 p.m., after 11 p.m., after midnight? At least that person's honest, okay? That's good, right? They've got a clear conscience. What I'm going to tell you right now is going to blow your mind. If you are asleep, meaning unconscious, by 10, you are going to get a longevity hormone, like human growth hormone, that will never appear again, no matter how much sleep you get after that. You have to be unconscious by 10. So try to sleep before 9. But what did Ellen White say about hours before midnight? Right? Don't bet against the prophet. You'll always be wrong. That's what I tell people. Nutrition is important, but also nature. Did you know that? Ellen White says to teach the people that healing power is not in drugs, but in nature. Did you know that? A lot of people don't spend enough time in nature. Yes, you can do all this stuff indoors, but you're not outside. Adam and Eve, God didn't create them a building. Did you know that? He created them to be outside, outside in nature, and we can go into that more as we coach you. Fresh air is not only important, but it's most important when you're sleeping, because when do you breathe most shallow? Right? When you're asleep. When do you get the best sleep? When you are on vacation going what? Camping, right? And when you're camping, you have all of those things ready to go. When you go camping, how early do you go to bed? Why do you go to sleep early when you're camping? Because it's dark, right? We don't got all these artificial lights like, eh, 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 right? So you go to sleep early. When you're camping, what's the air quality? Good, right? When you're camping, usually is it cold outside? Typically, colder environment. When you're camping, what do you hear around you? Nature. You have white noise. 
Do you realize that all the studies on sleep are fulfilled by a camping trip? I'm serious. It, for, for sleep. I mean, we have a sleep expert right here. We have Rod, Dr. Roger, right? The sleep expert. But you can get like an expensive sort of sleep study, whatever scenario, by just going camping. Do you realize that? It's a cold environment. It's a dark environment. There's white noise. It's good air quality. You can get all of that right there in nature. Sunshine, very important. But how many of you know how much sunlight you should get? What do they recommend for vitamin D? What are they saying now? Yeah, people used to think 15 minutes. But did you know that as a Caucasian individual, that if you came to my house in Seattle, now Seattle, is it a, a lot of sun there or not much? Not much. If you came there in April and you were in my backyard, my backyard is closed off, don't worry, and you just wanted to do sunning, in your birthday suit, in all your glory, right? Did you know how much vitamin D you'd make in an hour? Give me a guess. How many units? 400? 20? 10,000 units an hour. Did you know that? 10,000. How did you know that? That's pretty amazing. Good for you. 10,000 units an hour. Do you think really your daily requirement is 400? Do you think the daily requirement is really that small? If your body has the ability to produce that much, take advantage. Absolutely. This is a very important one. The second L in uh, eternal life is love. Do you know what virtue is defined as in the spirit of prophecy? Who knows the de definition of virtue? Give me a definition. Virtue has come out of him, right? You've heard that about Christ. Do you know what she defines virtue as? The healing power of love. Do you know what the strongest motivator on planet Earth is? Have you ever seen a guy, no job, dressed as poor, kind of a deadbeat, and then all of a sudden, he's like got this suit, he's got a great job, he's got money in the bank, he's got his cars washed. Do you know what just happened to him? He got a girl, exactly because he's in love, right? And that's the number one motivator. When you're in love with Jesus, and also it doesn't hurt to be in love with someone who's drop-dead gorgeous like my fiancé, right? But that's a strong motivator for change, right? When you look at how much you love that person, you want to do things. And that's so important. And I don't know how we've missed this as Adventists, is love, Love is one of the strongest natural remedies to give love but also receive love. It is more blessed to give than to receive, but what does that mean about receiving? It's also blessed, right? It's just more blessed to do the other. How many of you know about cold plunge? How many of you have looked at the literature of cold plunge? You know what I love about Seattle is I can run on a beach, which is like five minutes by my house. I can do my five kilometers and jump in the Puget Sound. And it is like 40-some degrees. It's cold. How long are you supposed to be in? Anyone know what the numbers are basically putting at? About six minutes. About six minutes. But you know what's perfect? You know what I do when I do that? As I have a bunch of scriptures that I've memorized... And I go through them all. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> he maketh me to lie down. Right? No, it's not that bad. You actually get used to it. How many of you have done it regularly? A anyway, few people. Good. Raises testosterone, growth hormone, lowers cortisol. I mean, everything good you can think of hormonally, cold plunge does. It's phenomenal. And you don't have to live near the beach. But I personally don't like doing the chlorine dunk. Right? I'd rather do it in the ocean. But you can do it from your tap with ice and stuff like that. So also drinking enough water. Family and friends, very, very important. You have to understand that even if your family members are nuts or neurotic or whatever, you still have to love them. And you can send them letters if you want to. But when it's their birthday, send them a letter. When it's Christmas, send them a letter. When it's their anniversary, send them a letter, right? Just send them love. I mean, what are they going to do to you through the mail? They can't reach out through you through the mail and strangle you, right? But just send them love. That's what God does, doesn't it? Who knows who Peter Vessels is? Any South Africans? Yes, that's right. Peter Vessels. Did you know 
that Ellen White kept sending him letters even when he was in apostasy. And finally, when he came to repentance, he read them all. God doesn't stop sending you letters just because you don't stop reading them. Just keep that in mind. Be like the Lord. The final one is the proprietary one. It's called evaluate. You have to be able to understand how your body responds to things. And I'll tell you right now, every one of you knows how to do this natural remedy already. I'll give you an example. Ellen White said beans are healthful articles of food, but beans are what to her? Who knows it? Poison. That's correct. How did Ellen White know that the beans were poison, would you say? She had what? Maybe some gastric distress, maybe some methane coming out, right? Maybe some cramping diarrhea. She had some GI distress, right? And she's like, this thing is like poison. Now, are beans healthful articles of food? Two tablespoons of beans, what does it do? For every two tablespoons, that's insanity. But do you think it's going to increase Ellen White's longevity? If she's like going to be gassed out, right, or whatever was happening to her. Yes, exactly. So that's the thing is you've got to evaluate how things work for you. And I'm going to prove to you that all of you know how to evaluate right now. How do you know you're dehydrated? How can you tell? Thirsty? What else? Something you can see. Who said that? Color. What changes color? And how do you know when you're rehydrated? Exactly. It's not as dark. All of you know how to evaluate your bodies. But I can teach you how to do that in every single area. Your body will tell you a clue of when you're doing something right and when you're doing something wrong. And it's things that are visual, audible, tactile, olfactory, all of your senses. God reaches you through your senses. You don't have to have a degree to figure these things out. I can show you with pretty good reliability when you're off on something because your body will tell you that it's off. And it will tell you in a way that you can recognize, but it's not always the same. Do you know how I can tell when I'm struggling against something infectious? I have a little digastric node that swells, just like this, the size of a pea. And if I don't jump on it and start doing something immediately, then I get sick. But if I take heed to the warning and I evaluate, right, my body and take a different trajectory, then I avoid the illness. So let's summarize all of these together. What is the secret of longevity? Is it diet? Did you know that Buddhists are vegetarian? Did you know Buddhist monks are vegan? Did you know that Brahmins are vegan? But they don't live longer. So what is it? Is it exercise? Did you know? Uh, but, but who else keeps the Sabbath? The Jews? Anyone else? Seventh-day Baptists? Anyone else? That's not the unique thing. And we only exercise, 10% of us exercise every day, so it's not that. Is it genetics? Is it genetics? No, the Adventists are from all genetic backgrounds. Is it optimism? Who remembers the characteristic that actually is predictive of longevity? Conscientiousness, right? Is it faith? Well, maybe it's the right faith. I'm going to appeal to you with this verse. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. And how many things? All things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. It's not something superficial to desire to live longer because God has put this desire where? In our hearts. How many of you remember the pastor who did the uh, God without, a, without God for a year? Who remembers that pastor? That pastor was actually one of my mentors at Weimar. And I'm going to share with you what he said to me. I said, hey, why don't you just stick with the Adventist church? Because we were going back and forth. And he was with a group of his friends. 
And we were going back and forth about longevity. And he said to me, I think if there was a group of people who were family-oriented, exercised, and ate a plant-based diet, they would also live 10 years longer. And I said, and where is that group of people? And then his friends got irate at me. And they started jumping all over. And he stopped them. He said, no, I concede to Riesenberger. He said, you're right. The Adventist church does live that 10 extra years. But I will surrender those 10 years, but be true to myself. He walked away, not just from 10 extra years, but he walked away from eternal life. Do you realize that? He's a pastor, like you are. But he's left our message. Will we go after him? That's the question. Will we go after the people around us? Do you know how we can do it? Right here. If you're Seventh-day Adventist, this is my appeal to you. At the court of Babylon were gathered representatives from how many lands? Men of the? The most richly endowed with? Natural gifts. Genetics, right? Possessed of the broadest culture that the world could bestow. Yet among them all, the Hebrew youth were what? What does it mean to be without a peer? There's no one like you. And what's the first thing she mentions? Do you realize that people judge you in seven seconds? And what are they going to see in seven seconds? Your physical, right? A smile, right? Maybe a few words out of your mouth. But this is important. God wants us to be healthy. Physical strength and what else? Beauty. Then mental vigor and literary attainment. They stood, what? Unrivaled. The erect form, the firm elastic step, the fair countenance, the undimmed senses, the what? That's a way you can evaluate yourself, right? The untainted breath. All were so many certificates of good habits, insignia of the nobility with which nature honors those who are obedient to her laws. Do you think if every Seventh-day Adventist was this, that people would pay attention? <sighs> what if we lived 50 extra years instead of 10 extra years? Do you think people would pay attention? I think they would. My appeal to you is this. You can share the health message, the three angels message with everybody. Do you know how? It's you. It's your testimony. It's Laurel's testimony. It's Ashley's testimony. It's my testimony of what God has done in your life. And people say, well, I haven't done anything. My life's a mess. Well, let's start today. How many of you can think of some area of your life that you need to improve? Raise your hand. One area. If you would like to say, God, help me to change that one area, please stand with me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can share what you've done in our lives. And you see people standing. They've made a commitment to change one thing. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength and grace to change not only that one thing, but as we get the courage with our successes, Lord, let us look to you for further successes. Lord, I pray that whether it's weight loss, whether it's migraines, whether it's longevity, whether it's whatever the gift you've given us, let everyone know that they can be a testimony. They can be a witness of your message, Lord. And through that witness, someone else can believe that just as you have helped them, that you can also help anyone in that situation. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Tim. There's some interesting tidbits in there. Obviously, our breakout sessions are not starting right now. So let's say we're going to start in 10 minutes, so that gives everybody a chance to get up and move around a little bit, and we'll... Just start at uh, 3.25, and then we'll give the presenters 10 minutes on the other end, so you still have your same time. So go ahead, get up, move around. <laughs>